Part One, Chapter Six of *The Man of Property*. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Foresight Saga, *The Man of Property* by John Galsworthy, Part One, Chapter Six, James at Large. It was not long before Soames's determination to build went to the round of the family, and created the flutter that any decision connected with property should make among Forsytes. It was not his fault, for he had been determined that no one should know. June, in the fullness of her heart, had told Mrs. Small, giving her leave only to tell Aunt Anne. She thought it would cheer her, the poor old sweet, for Aunt Anne had kept her room now for many days. Mrs. Small told Aunt Anne at once, who, smiling as she lay back on her pillows, said in her distinct, trembling old voice, "It's very nice for dear June, but I hope they will be careful. It's rather dangerous." When she was left alone again, a frown, like a cloud presaging a rainy morrow, crossed her face. While she was lying there so many days, the process of recharging her will went on all the time. It spread to her face too, and tightening movements were always in action at the corners of her lips. The maid Smither, who had been in her service since girlhood and was spoken of as Smither, a good girl, but so slow. The maid Smither performed every morning with extreme punctiliousness. The crowning ceremony of that ancient toilet, taking from the recesses of their pure white bandbox those flat grey curls, the insignia of personal dignity, she placed them securely in her mistress's hands, and turned her back. And every day, Aunts Julie and Hester were required to come and report on Timothy, what news there was of Nicholas. Whether dear June had succeeded in getting Jolyon to shorten the engagement, now that Mr. Bosony was building Soames a house, whether young Roger's wife was really expecting, how the operation on Archie had succeeded, and what Swithin had done about that empty house in Wigmore Street where the tenant had lost all his money and treated him so badly, above all about Soames, was Irene still, still asking for a separate room? And every morning, Smither was told, "I shall be coming down this afternoon, Smither, about two o'clock. I shall want your arm after all these days in bed." After telling Aunt Anne, Mrs. Small had spoken of the house in the strictest confidence to Mrs. Nicholas, who, in her turn, had asked Winifred Darty for confirmation, supposing, of course, that being Soames's sister, she would know all about it. Through her, it had in due course come round to the ears of James. He had been a good deal agitated. Nobody, he said, told him anything, and rather than go direct to Soames himself, of whose taciturnity he was afraid, he took his umbrella and went round to Timothy's. He found Mrs. Septimus and Hester, who had been told. She was so safe; she found it tiring to talk. Ready and indeed eager to discuss the news, it was very good of dear Soames. They thought to employ Mr. Bosony, but rather risky. What had George named him? The Buccaneer? How droll! But George was always droll. However, it would be all in the family. They supposed that they must really look upon Mr. Bosony as belonging to the family, though it seemed strange. James here broke in. Nobody knows anything about him. I don't see what Soames wants with a young man like that. I shouldn't be surprised if Irene had put her oar in. I shall speak to Soames," interposed Aunt Juley. "Told Mr. Bosony that he didn't wish it mentioned. He wouldn't like it to be talked about, I'm sure. And if Timothy knew, he would be very vexed. I," James put his hand behind his ear. "What?" he said. "I'm getting very deaf. I suppose I don't hear people." Emily's got a bad toe. We shan't be able to start for Wales till the end of the month. There's always something, and having got what he wanted, he took his hat and went away. 
It was a fine afternoon, and he walked across the park towards Soames's, where he intended to dine, for Emily's toe kept her in bed, and Rachel and Cicely were on visit in the country. He took the slanting path from the Bayswater side of the row to the Knightsbridge Gate, across a pasture of short burnt grass dotted with blackened sheep strewn with seated couples and strange waves lying prone on their faces, like corpses on a field over which the wave of battle has rolled. He walked rapidly, his head bent, looking neither to the right nor left. The appearance of this park, the centre of his own battlefield, where he had all his life been fighting, excited no thought or speculation in his mind. These corpses flung down there from out the press and turmoil of the struggle, these pairs of lovers sitting cheek by jowl for an hour of idle Elysium snatched from the monotony of their treadmill, awakened no fancies in his mind. He had outlived that kind of imagination. His nose, like the nose of a sheep, was fastened to the pastures on which he browsed. One of his tenants had lately shown a disposition to be behindhand in his rent, and it had become a grave question whether he had not better turn him out at once, and so run the risk of not re-letting before Christmas. Swithin had just been let in very badly, but it had served him right. He would held on too long. He pondered this as he walked steadily, holding his umbrella carefully by the wood, just below the crook of the handle so as to keep the ferrule off the ground, and not fray the silk in the middle. And with his thin high shoulders stooped, his long legs moving with swift mechanical precision, this passage through the park, where the sun shone with a clear flame on so much idleness, on so many human evidences of the remorseless battle of property raging beyond its ring, was like the flight of some land bird across the sea. He felt a touch on his arm, as he came out at Albert Gate. It was Soames, who, crossing from the shady side of Piccadilly, where he had been walking home from the office, had suddenly appeared alongside. "'Your mother's in bed,' said James. "'I was just coming to you, but I suppose I shall be in the way.' The outward relations between James and his son were marked by a lack of sentiment peculiarly foresightian. But for all that the two were by no means unattached. Perhaps they regarded one another as an investment. Certainly they were solicitors of each other's welfare, glad of each other's company. They had never exchanged two words upon the more intimate problems of life, or revealed in each other's presence the existence of any deep feeling. Something beyond the power of word analysis bound them together, something hidden deep in the fibre of nations and families, for blood, they say, is thicker than water, and neither of them was a cold-blooded man. Indeed, in James, love of his children was now the prime motive of his existence. To have creatures who were parts of himself, to whom he might transmit the money he saved, was at the root of his saving, and at seventy-five what was left that could give him pleasure but saving. The kernel of life was in this saving for his children. Than James Forsyte, notwithstanding all his Jonahisms, there was no saner man, if the leading symptom of sanity, as we are told, is self-preservation, though without doubt Timothy went too far, in all this London of which he owned so much, and loved with such a dumb love as the centre of his opportunities. He had the marvellous instinctive sanity of the middle class. In him, more than in Jollyon with his masterful will, and his moments of tenderness and philosophy, more than in Swithin the martyr to crankiness, Nicholas the sufferer from ability, and Roger the victim of enterprise, beat the true pulse of compromise, of all the brothers, he was the least remarkable in mind and person, and for that reason more likely to live for ever. To James, more than to any of the others, was the family significant and dear. There had always been something primitive and cosy in his attitude towards life. He loved the family hearth, he loved gossip, and he loved grumbling. All his decisions were formed of a cream which he skimmed off the family mind, and— 
through that family, off the minds of thousands of other families of similar fibre. Year after year, week after week, he went to Timothy's, and in his brother's front drawing-room, his legs twisted, his long white whiskers framing his clean-shaven mouth, would sit watching the family pot simmer, the cream rising to the top, and he would go away sheltered, refreshed, comforted, with an indefinable sense of comfort. Beneath the adamant of his self-preserving instinct there was much real softness in James. A visit to Timothy's was like an hour spent in the lap of a mother, and the deep craving he himself had for the protection of the family wing reacted in turn on his feelings towards his own children. It was a nightmare to him to think of them exposed to the treatment of the world in money, health, or reputation. When his old friend John Street's son volunteered for special service, he shook his head querulously, and wondered what John Street was about to allow it. And when young Street was assegaied, he took it so much to heart that he made a point of calling everywhere with the special object of saying, he knew how it would be, he'd no patience with them. When his son-in-law, Darty, had that financial crisis due to speculation in oil shares, James made himself ill, worrying over it. The knell of all prosperity seemed to have sounded. It took him three months, and a visit to Baden-Baden, to get better. There was something terrible in the idea that but for his, James's money, Darty's name might have appeared in the bankruptcy list. Composed of a physiological mixture so sound that if he had an earache he thought he was dying, he regarded the occasional ailments of his wife and children as in the nature of personal grievances, special interventions of providence for the purpose of destroying his peace of mind. But he did not believe at all in the ailments of people outside his own immediate family, affirming them in every case to be due to neglected liver. His universal comment was, what can they expect? I'll have it myself if I'm not careful." When he went to Soames's that evening, he felt that life was hard on him. There was Emily with a bad toe, and Rachel gadding about in the country. He got no sympathy from anybody, and Anne—she was ill. He did not believe she would last through the summer. He had called there three times now without her being able to see him. And this idea of Soames's building a house—that would have to be looked into. As to the trouble with Irene, he didn't know what was to come of that. Anything might come of it. He entered 62 Montpellier Square, with the fullest intentions of being miserable. It was already half-past seven, and Irene, dressed for dinner, was seated in the drawing-room. She was wearing her gold-coloured frock, for, having been displayed at a dinner-party, a soiree, and a dance, it was now to be worn at home and she had adorned the bosom with a cascade of lace, on which James's eyes riveted themselves at once. "'Where do you get your things?' he said in an aggravated voice. "'I never see Rachel and Cicely looking half so well. That rose-point now, that's not real.' Irene came close to prove to him that he was in error, and, in spite of himself, James felt the influence of her deference of the faint seductive perfume exhaling from her. No self-respecting foresight surrendered at a blow, so he merely said he didn't know he expected she was spending a pity penny on dress. The gong sounded, and, putting her white arm within his, Irene took him into the dining-room. She seated him in Soames's usual place round the corner on her left. The light fell softly there, so that he would not be worried by the gradual dying of the day and she began to talk to him about himself. Presently, over James, came a change, like the mellowing that steals upon a fruit in the sun, a sense of being caressed and praised and petted, and all without the bestowal of a single caress or word of praise. He felt that what he was eating was agreeing with him. He could not get that feeling at home. He did not know when he had enjoyed a glass of champagne so much, and, on inquiring the brand and price, was surprised to find that it was one of which he had a large stock himself, but could never drink. He instantly formed the resolution to let his wine-merchant know that he had been swindled. Looking up from his food, he remarked, 
You've a lot of nice things about the place. Now, what did you give her that sugar sifter? Shouldn't wonder if it was worth money. He was particularly pleased with the appearance of a picture on the wall opposite which he himself had given them. I'd no idea it was so good, he said. They rose to go into the drawing room, and James followed Irene closely. That's what I call a capital little dinner, he murmured, breathing pleasantly down on her shoulder. Nothing heavy and not too Frenchified, but I can't get it at home. I pay my cook sixty pounds a year, but she can't give me a dinner like that. He had as yet made no allusion to the building of the house, nor did he, when Soames, pleading the excuse of business, betook himself to the room at the top where he kept his pictures. James was left alone with his daughter-in-law. The glow of the wine and of an excellent liqueur was still within him. He felt quite warm toward her. She was really a taking little thing. She listened to you and seemed to understand what you were saying, and, while talking, he kept examining her figure from her bronze-coloured shoes to the waved gold of her hair. She was leaning back in an empire chair, her shoulders poised against the top, her body, flexibly straight and unsupported from the hips, swaying when she moved, as though giving to the arms of a lover. Her lips were smiling, her eyes half-closed. It may have been a recognition of danger in the very charm of her attitude, or a twang of digestion that caused a sudden dumbness to fall on James. He did not remember ever having been quite alone with Irene before, and, as he looked at her, an odd feeling crept over him, as though he had come across something strange and foreign. Now what was she thinking about, sitting back like that? Thus, when he spoke, it was in a sharper voice, as if he had been awakened from a pleasant dream. "'What do you do with yourself all day?' he said. You never come round to Park Lane." She seemed to be making very lame excuses, and James did not look at her. He did not want to believe that she was really avoiding them. It would mean too much. "'I expect the fact is you haven't time,' he said. "'You're always about with June. I expect you're useful to her with her young man, chaperoning, and one thing and another. They tell me she's never at home now. Your Uncle Jolly, and he doesn't like it, I fancy, being left so much alone as he is. They tell me she's always hanging about for this young Bosony. I suppose he comes here every day. Now what do you think of him? Do you think he knows his own mind? He seems to me a poor thing. I should say the grey mare was the better horse." The colour deepened in Irene's face, and James watched her suspiciously. "'Perhaps you don't quite understand, Mr. Bosony,' she said. "'Don't understand him,' James hurried out. "'Why not?' You can see he's one of these artistic chaps. They say he's clever. They all think they're clever. You know more about him than I do," he added, and again his suspicious glance rested on her. "'He is designing a house for Soames,' she said softly, evidently trying to smooth things over. "'That brings me to what I was going to say,' continued James. "'I don't know what Soames wants with a young man like that. Why doesn't he go to a first-rate man?' Perhaps Mr. Bossini is first-rate." James rose, and took a turn with bent head. "'That's it,' he said. "'You young people, you all stick together. You all think you know best.' Halting his tall, lank figure before her, he raised a finger and levelled it at her bosom, as though bringing an indictment against her beauty. "'All I can say is, these artistic people, or whatever they call themselves, they're as unreliable as they can be, and my advice to you is this. Don't you have too much to do with him?" Irene smiled, and in the curve of her lips was a strange provocation. She seemed to have lost her deference. Her breast rose and fell as though with secret anger. She drew her hands inward from their rest on the arms of her chair, until the tips of her fingers met, and her dark eyes looked unfathomably at James. The latter gloomily scrutinized the floor. "'I'll tell you my opinion,' he said. "'It's a pity you haven't got a child to think about and occupy you.' A brooding look came instantly on Irene's face, and even James became conscious of the rigidity that took possession of her whole figure beneath the softness of its silk and lace clothing. 
He was frightened by the effect he had produced, and, like most men with but little courage, he sought at once to justify himself by bullying. "'You don't seem to care what's going about. Why don't you drive down to Hurlingham with us, and go to the theatre now and then? At your time of life you ought to take an interest in things. You're a young woman.' The brooding look darkened on her face. He grew nervous. "'Well, I know nothing about it,' he said. "'Nobody tells me anything. Soames ought to be able to take care of himself. If he can't take care of himself, he mustn't look to me. That's all.' Biting the corner of his forefinger, he stole a cold, sharp look at his daughter-in-law. He encountered her eyes fixed on his own, so dark and deep that he stopped, and broke into a gentle perspiration. "'Well, I must be going,' he said, after a short pause and a minute later rose with a slight appearance of surprise, as though he had expected to be asked to stop. Giving his hand to Irene, he allowed himself to be conducted to the door and let out into the street. He would not have a cab, he would walk. Irene was to say good-night to Soames for him, and if she wanted a little gaiety, well, he would drive her down to Richmond any day. He walked home, and, going upstairs, woke Emily out of the first sleep she had had for four-and-twenty hours, to tell her that it was his impression things were in a bad way at Soames's. On this theme he descanted for half an hour, until at last, saying that he would not sleep a wink, he turned on his side, and instantly began to snore. In Montpellier Square, Soames, who had come from the picture-room, stood invisible at the top of the stairs, watching Irene sort the letters brought by the last post. She turned back into the drawing-room, but in a minute came out and stood as if listening. Then she came stealing up the stairs with a kitten in her arms. He could see her face bent over the little beast which was purring against her neck. Why couldn't she look at him like that? Suddenly she saw him and her face changed. "'Any letters for me?' he said. Three. He stood aside and without another word she passed on into the bedroom. End of Part 1 Chapter 6